it. And so here now the word of the Lord, 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 9. As always, I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them at Telaam, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up, uh, when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hevilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. As we approach the spring, we get a, a great foretaste of that today with a, a change of time that's getting uh, darker uh, a lot later now in the evening. We mentioned a little bit about that this morning. Um, as the weather slowly changes too, and we're experiencing a little bit warmer temperatures here and there throughout the day, I've recently been thinking a lot about all of the yard work that I'm going to have to do on my lawn this year. Um, you see, at the end of last summer, my lawn was in pretty rough shape. There were weeds everywhere. There was dying grass. In some places, no grass remained at all, only dirt. Now, in previous years, and particularly when we moved into our current house about three years ago, I would have found yard work to be pretty invigorating. There, there was a time when, when I looked forward to getting my hands dirty and sculpting my landscape into one of the most well-manicured man lawns in the cul-de-sac. But sadly, if I'm honest with myself, that's not the case this year. Uh, this year, I know all of the work that's in front of me because I see it every day. There's no more snow on the ground to mask all the bald spots in my yard. And this year, unlike previous years, I have no passion to invest in that work. The work that needs to be done to get everything immaculate seems rather daunting, and there are frankly other things that I'd much rather do with my time. And so I know that this year, Going into another spring, I'm going to have to fight the desire to do just the bare minimum and to do even that without grumbling about it. Now, I'm sure we all have in our lives chores or duties like that, things that we know we ought to do, but things that we tend to approach not with excellence, but with the resignation to do the absolute bare bones minimum. Right? There are certain duties in our lives that we're not excited to do, that we have no passion to do, and that are often clouded in our lives by other priorities that we'd rather do. But is this also how we relate to God? You see, when we turn to our text and we come to this final downfall in the narrative of Saul as king, we find a king who also doesn't seem all that passionate or consumed with the glory and honor of God. As we'll see, other priorities, priorities other than the glory of God, take center stage throughout his life, and they pop up in this narrative. We'll see that he doesn't approach his duty with the excellence that God demands of his people, and certainly of his king. And in fact, that even might be an understatement because Paul, Saul doesn't even do his duty. And at the end of the day, He's not even grieved by his sin against God when he's finally confronted by it. It seems that this king, King Saul, doesn't care all that much, isn't passionate all that much about the great king, the Lord of hosts. 
Saul's approach to God's word and to the obedience God requires of his king, we find is superficial at best. And the aftermath of his dispassionate obedience to God really is disobedience. We learn that God rejects his superficial submission. That's our big idea as we dip into this text. Our big idea is that God rejects superficial submission. As we work through this text, we're going to do it in four points. Uh, The first is we're going to hear about the mandate of God's king, the first three verses. Then we'll move to seeing the superficial obedience of God's king in verses 4 through 9. Then the rejection of God's king in verses 10 through 31. And then finally, the hope of a better king in verses 32 through 35. I think there are sermon um, outlines in the in the parlor if you need to grab one of those or in the narthex if you need to grab one of those. But the outline again is the mandate of God's king, the superficial obedience of God's king, the rejection of God's king, and the hope for God's better king. Let's begin with this first point. First, the mandate of God's king. And to back up for a moment outside of our text and to, and to, to go a little bit earlier into biblical history, we have to understand that within Israel's government, within Israel's monarchy, the king of Israel was never seen to have absolute authority over the people of God. Rather, he was always positioned as someone under authority. Specifically, he was under God's authority. And therefore, one of the biggest, most important responsibilities that the king of Israel had was to listen to God's word. As far back as the book of Deuteronomy, before Israel even had a king, a human king, this was one of the primary responsibilities articulated for this king. Whoever sat on the throne was called in Deuteronomy 17 to have his own personal copy of the law of God a copy that he would meditate upon each day. Hearing and heeding God's word was something that lay at the heart of the responsibilities of God's king. And so when our passage opens in 1 Samuel 15, it's no surprise that the first commandment that comes to Saul through Samuel is simply this command to listen. Right? A king was supposed to listen to God's word. And so to hear, Samuel calls Saul to listen to the word that comes through him. And that's no different than what we would have found back in Deuteronomy 17. But if this first command to listen takes us not at all by surprise, this second command that comes to Saul in our passage, and the one that takes center stage in this chapter, well, that command may take us a little bit more by surprise. Because in the second command, Saul is being called to wage holy war upon Amalek and to devote every single inhabitant, man, woman, and child, to utter destruction, as well as all of the possessions and livestock of the Amalekites as well. I think we'd all agree that it's easier to submit to God's word simply when God tells us to listen than when some of the commandments, the specific commandments he gives to his people are articulated, and that's certainly the case here. But in this unique case, the Lord then gives a clear reason for this audacious command to wage holy war on the Amalekites. You see, it's not as if God had just at this point picked out a random people in the region for Saul to annihilate arbitrarily. Rather, the Lord roots this command through Samuel in something that happened centuries earlier in Israel's history. Now, you may remember this story, the story that just after Israel was delivered out of slavery and captivity in Egypt in the Exodus, after the plagues and the harrowing experience by by the Red Sea, you may remember what happened. Israel then encountered their first big obstacle when uh, the Amalekites, this people group called the Amalekites, came out to fight against them. When Israel was most vulnerable, when they were faint and weary, the Amalekites tried to destroy them. Now in the battle that ensued, this is recorded for us in Deuteronomy, or sorry, in Exodus chapter 17, a battle between Israel and the Amalekites, Israel fortunately emerges victorious. There's the scene of Moses having his two arms raised, And when his arms are raised, then the Israelites are gaining the victory. And at the end of the day, Israel wins this great victory. But what the Amalekites had done in attacking God's people, who God calls elsewhere the apple of his eye, 
the book of Deuteronomy, was so heinous, it was so evil that the Lord determined in the wake of that battle to, quote, utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And now, when we turn to our text, the time had come at last with Saul on the throne for Amalek and the Amalekites to be judged. Now, passages like this where God calls upon his people to wage holy war against people groups and to, to absolutely annihilate them are passages that might call some alarm for us as Christians when we hear those commands. And so if that unsettles you, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards and explain that a little bit further. But the good news that emerges from this unique command that God gives to his king, to King Saul at this time in history, is that God had not forgotten the injustice that was shown to his people, nor does God ever forget or lose sight of his enemies. And beyond this specific command in this specific time and place, friends, the same holds true today as well. You see, even when the church suffers at the hand of those who seek her ruin, and even when we suffer injustice as Christians for being Christians, the Lord hasn't lost sight of the enemies of his church and the enemies of the gospel. And friends, that's good news. But the question for us, and a question that's also before Saul, is have we lost sight of evil or grown too comfortable with those things in our world that oppose the kingdom of God and his purposes? Let me tell you a story. Last month, um, I read a book about uh, the U.S. ambassador to Germany in the early 1930s, just after Hitler became the chancellor of Germany. And the U.S. ambassador's name was a guy named William Dodd. Uh, this book uh, chronicled all the issues that Dodd had to navigate uh, during these initial years of Hitler's regime. Um, it chronicles all of the uncomfortable meetings that he had with Hitler and other high up officials in the Nazi government and all the evil that began to slowly unfold throughout the country during this period of time. It was a fascinating read just historically. But the book also highlighted the various members of Dodd's family who were with him in Germany during his ambassadorship. And specifically, it highlighted quite a bit his adult daughter, a young woman named Martha. Now, while everyone in the family, in Dodd's family, had a front row seat to all of the evil that was slowly ramping up in Nazi Germany during those years, Martha, at least in these initial years, was swept up in a, really, in a lot of really bad and promiscuous ways in all of the changing winds in Germany. Uh, rather than naming evil for what it was, which any American could clearly see, Martha was constantly justifying the actions of the Nazis here and there. She found the swirling militarism among the young Germans not ominous, but oddly charming. And while the other people in the U.S. Embassy were sounding the alarm, Martha, at least in the initial years, was romanticizing in a really weird way much of what she saw. Now, as those who can look back upon the horrors that were inflicted by the Nazis, it's not hard for us to look in retrospect back to those things and say pretty easily those things were evil. But when it comes to things in our world today, or even certain things in our own lives, are we sober enough to look evil in the eyes and call it for what it is? Or are there places, maybe in your own life right now, where you're cozying up to things that God calls evil without calling it what it is? I understand that the command issue to Saul in this passage, it's not something that we're called to replicate today. We're not called to wage war upon an entire people group or anything of the sort, but we are called to wage a different kind of war, not a war against flesh and blood, but as Paul puts it, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, as Christians, we can't take a light or superficial view to evils like that or cozy up towards things that God has determined to bring to nothing. And this is exactly what God expects of his king in our passage. The question, though, is has Saul, in our passage, seen the problem of the Amalekites as God has seen them? Has Saul looked evil in the face and seen it for what it is. 
Well, sadly, we're going to come to find as we continue in this text that as far as Saul goes, uh, the answer is no. Saul's given through Samuel this hard word. He's called to deal with the Amalekites as God's instrument of judgment. But as the passage, passage continues, we see how Saul sadly responds to God's clear command with superficial obedience. So this leads to our second point. Second, the superficial obedience of God's king. Now, initially, as the passage continues, it, it seems that Saul responds, at least at first, pretty well to God's word. Look at what he does. He first gathers troops. He gathers a lot of troops. He gathers 210,000 of them. <clears throat> There's no chance that Saul's going to risk being overmatched by the Amalekites. And then when he arrives at the place of battle, we see that he shows care towards this other group called the Kenites. He wants to avoid any collateral damage or um, risk them getting swept up in any of the violence that's about to unfold. It, it looks, at least from these initial signals, like God's word may have just penetrated his heart. Saul looks determined to carry through with God's command in a carefully calculated and determined manner. But then the problems emerge. You see, though Saul devotes nearly everything to destruction, he doesn't vote, devote everything to destruction. For one thing, he spares first the king of the Amalekites, this man named Agag, and then second, he also spares the best of their livestock. So why doesn't Saul carry out God's clear commands in the way that God clearly intended? Well, later in the passage, when Samuel confronts Saul about these very issues, Saul tells Samuel that he spared the best of the livestock so that he could offer a sacrifice to God. On the surface of it, that sounds like a noble excuse. But leaving aside whether that was actually his motivation in sparing the best of the livestock, Saul assumes that he knows better than God. As if by doing these things, God would somehow respond, Oh, thank you, Saul. I didn't think that I could be more glorified through sparing these things, but you showing me a new way, Saul. Thank you so much, Saul, for showing me something I lacked to see, I wasn't able to see. No, not at all. In short, this is an example of God's king simply not submitting, rebelling, in fact, against God's word. And in the process, exalting himself over God's word. His pretense of submission here is really self-exaltation and a blindness to evil. And that's seen a little bit more clearly in this sparing of not just the livestock, but the king of the Amalekites, this guy named Agag. You see, understand that in sparing Agag, it's not as if Saul is extending mercy from a king to a king, as if he's chivalrously looking out for one of his own. That would still be disobedient, but it might add even a faintest sliver of silver lining to the whole ordeal. But rather, Agag here is presented as Saul's prize of war. Uh, one commentator notes that this was a common practice in the ancient Near East, um, namely displaying a royal slave as a monument of another king's triumph in battle. And the fact that Saul, what does he do next in the passage or later in the passage? In verse 12, we find that he sets up a monument for himself, for his own glory, to commemorate his own victory. It's as if he leverages evil, sparing evil Agag as a monument to exalting himself. And in sparing what he did, well, his heart is exposed. His superficial, imperfect obedience is in fact just willful and deliberate disobedience. And ultimately it's because Saul's heart desires someone else's glory other than the glory of the Lord. Now, by way of application, I think this poses a great challenge to all of us, too. You know, I can recall a conversation <clears throat> that I had with some Christian friends uh, back in college, shortly after I became a Christian my freshman year. Um, I don't remember the exact situation, uh, but it was in the course of one of my famously uh, theologically naive conversations as a freshman in college and a new convert to Christianity, um, what some might call one's cage stage, right? Um, that kind of phase we're in. 
Well, anyway, my friends and I were having one of our conversations, as we did, and I remember my friends began to criticize the practice of excommunication in the church. I don't remember the exact story, but one of our other friends told us a story about how his home church just excommunicated somebody, and I don't remember the reasons for that or anything, but I do remember that my friends just immediately scoffed at that notion. Excommunication, that's unbiblical, they said. That's unloving, it's unkind, it's unjust. They were very critical of the whole thing. They, they reasoned that, that, that it was unbecoming of Christians to ever use such a tool. Now again, I don't remember the, the specifics of our conversation, but do we, do we ever approach God's clear commands in that kind of way? Now to be sure, God calls us as Christians to do many hard things. There are many hard things, including things like excommunication, that are commanded of God's people in his word. But if there, are there ever occasions in our lives when we butt up against some of those commands and we reason instead, well, God doesn't really mean that. He can't really mean that. That's too hard, too demanding. Are there ever times when we play exegetical gymnastics with God's word, seeking to avoid the clear implications of what God calls us to do? Because like Saul, we think we know better. We think we know what's more kind and more just in God's world. Well, this is what Saul does in our passage. He thinks he knows best. In this case, he's after his own glory. And at the end of the day, his actions in this text well, they carry dire consequences. And in the aftermath of all of these events, we find that sadly, God rejects Saul from being king. So this leads to our third point. Third, the re rejection of God's king. And here we're gonna pick up in the text where we left off and we're gonna read verse 10 through the end of our passage, verse 35. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. <clears throat> and Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. 
So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death has passed. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. You know, as a dad, um, there are often times when my kids will come to me and congratulate themselves on something they accomplished, something that I asked them to do. Uh, but then sometimes, not always, but sometimes, I'll go and examine uh, the fruit of their accomplishments. And let's just say there are some times when I am um, less than impressed at what they were able to accomplish. Uh, the primary example is when, you know, as a father, you ask your kids to clean up their rooms. And um, admittedly, even though they're a little bit proud of how well they cleaned up their rooms, I might walk into their rooms and be, uh, um, uh, there might be a, quite a bit more work left to do in their rooms. I might not be as proud um, of their accomplishments maybe as they are, though I always appreciate the efforts. Well, this is something like we find in the next part of our passage. Because Samuel rises early to meet Saul in the aftermath of this battle, all the while knowing that Saul had failed to do what the Lord called him to do. The Lord told Samuel as much. But when Saul greets Samuel upon his arrival, what does he say? He says, blessed, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Really? Is Saul really that delusional? Well, before we scoff too hard at Saul, we should also probably reflect a little bit on our own maneuverings around God's word. Uh, the commentator Bill Arnold writes this of Saul's assertion of obedience on our passage. He says, quote, this too is a common strategy for escaping condemnation. In the face of exposed disobedience, many have attempted to redefine what it actually means to obey. And that many probably includes, well, you and me a bit too. But when Samuel, back to our text, points out the obvious, the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen, as the most blatant example that Saul had not, in fact, obeyed the word of the Lord, Saul now realizes that he has some explaining to do. And his explanation that follows is, it's quite telling. First, first thing he does is he places the blame elsewhere. He says, it wasn't me who spared the sheep. It was them, referring to the people of Israel who spared the sheep of the Amalekites. It's interesting that Saul was all about memorializing his great victory at Carmel, but when he's confronted with the darker side of that victory, uh, the blame can't fall with him. Right? The, the blame falls squarely on his subjects. And then when Samuel confronts Saul further about his failure, Saul continues to insist upon his obedience, and he continues to blame the people that he's been called to lead and serve. He says in verse 21 specifically, but, but the people took of the spoil. Couldn't help it. Couldn't do anything about it. And so after all the blame shifting, Samuel gets to the heart of his, the issue. And in verses 22 through 23, he clarifies something that we hear clarified a bit more in a bit more places in the scriptures too. He reminds Saul that what God desired wasn't just some rote external sacrifice so you could check the box a sacrifice that didn't reflect his heart. Rather, God wanted heart obedience that looked at the treasures of the world, or in this case, the treasures of the Amalekites, and said no to them, and said no to self-glory, and yes to the glory of God and God's commands. Now, it's not that the Lord in the Old Covenant didn't want burnt offerings and sacrifices. After all, he ordained the entire sacrificial system for Israel. But what he wanted above everything else was obedient and thankful hearts among his people and certainly of his king rather than the superficial obedience that Saul offered instead. Now, when Saul hears Samuel's words here, his response shifts on a dime. Notice that now he acknowledges his sin. He, he asks for pardon and he pleads with Samuel not to abandon him. But don't think for a moment that this is genuine repentance on the part of Saul, because there are several clues in the text that, that definitely suggest otherwise. 
First, notice how Saul refers here to God, to Samuel, and even to the people of Israel. He refers to the Lord as the Lord your God. He refers to the word of the Lord delivered through Samuel as your words, not God's words. And he refers to the people of Israel as my people in verse 30. These aren't words from the lips of a king who submits with a whole and humble heart to the Lord in repentance. God is not really his God. The words he disobeyed, as he sees it, are only Samuel's words, and the people of Israel belong not to God, but to him. He has interpreted the situation completely backwards. And in this repentance, he hasn't really taken responsibility for much of anything. But of course, we do the same thing too, don't we? Quite frequently we do. Have you ever watched somebody? Um, Maybe this has been you as well. Uh, When you walk down the sidewalk or you see someone walk down the sidewalk with their their, uh, face glued to their phone, and then they stumble over an uneven surface, and what do they do or what do you do afterwards? Well, you look down at the concrete as if there was something wrong with the concrete. It wasn't your fault that you tripped over this concrete. It wasn't because you were obliviously looking at your phone while strolling down the sidewalk. It was the homeowner's fault that the sidewalk was uneven. Or or it it uh, it was the city of Omaha's fault that the sidewalk was uneven. It was their fault. It wasn't your fault. You see, we all know what it's like, and that's a silly example, but we all know what it's like to deflect and minimize our sin like Saul does in our text. And we all know what it's like to be more worried about how other people see us than owning up to the realities of our own folly. And this is what we find next with Saul. Notice that after Samuel informs Saul that the kingdom has been torn away from him because of his sin, Saul's concern is that Samuel honor him before the elders of the people of Israel. He was desperate for Samuel to continue with him only because he wanted to save face. And he was worried about how this event may affect his reputation and glory before the elders. At the end of the day, Saul hasn't really taken responsibility for any of his sin. He's far more concerned with the consequences of his sin than with his sin itself. And in the midst of all of this disobedience and blindness on the part of Saul, well, we read something that the Lord says. And it's something that may leave us with quite a few questions to ask. Notice that as far back as verse 11 in our passage, after Saul's disobedient surface, notice what the Lord said to Samuel. He said, I regret that I have made Saul king. And then in verse 35, the very end of our passage, we hear the same thing. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, that statement itself merits some explanation, but then there's a further wrinkle in verse 29 when Samuel tells Saul, the glory of Israel, in reference to the Lord, will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. So on the one hand, God is said to have regret over something he did, which leaves us with questions about God's foreknowledge and his sovereignty. But then on the other hand, in verse 29, that would seem to contradict those assertions. And so how do we work out this puzzle and solve it? Well, understand a few things. First, understand that God had sovereignly ordained everything that came to pass in this passage, just as he sovereignly ordained everything that comes to pass in history, whether big or small. As Jesus puts it in Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And yet, verses 11 and 35 underscore that God, though sovereign, is still grieved over disobedience. Dale Ralph Davis puts it like this. He says, verse 11 does not intend to suggest Yahweh's fickleness of purpose, but his sorrow over sin. It does not depict Yahweh flustered over his lack of, over lack of foresight, but Yahweh grieved over lack of obedience on Saul's part. Now, God's grief, of course, is not like our grief, but it's put in these terms so that we, as the people of God, might understand God's heart a little bit better and that we, too, would be grieved over sin. God doesn't take take delight in the disobedience of anyone. It grieves him. So does your own sin. Does it grieve you, too? But then second, we're also told in verse 29 that God doesn't have regret. Regret. 
Now, in context, this statement comes after Samuel declares emphatically that the Lord has torn the kingdom away from Saul that day and given it to a neighbor who is better than him. And that neighbor is King David, and we'll hear more about him in the next chapter that follows. But God, the point here is that God will not change his mind about this decree. God has decreed it. It will be done. God will not change his mind about it, but it's still a grievous situation. In God's providence, Saul has been rejected as king. And even in the midst of what's ar- what, what arguably makes this even sadder is that Saul just doesn't seem to get it. God is grieved, but Saul is not really grieved. So how about you? Now, of course, it needs to be stated that as believers in Jesus Christ, understand the work that God began in us in Christ, he will most definitely carry through to its completion. And the father will lose none of whom the son, or the son will lose none of whom the father has given to him. The promise of our perseverance as Christians in Christ holds fast, and there's so much assurance to be had in that as Christians, even with our sin in mind. But when your sin is called out and exposed, and even when you face the consequences for your sin, what grieves you more? Are you more concerned with the consequences of your sin? More concerned with losing face? Or are you more concerned with how your sin dishonors God? The sad reality is that Saul is God's failed and rejected king, and he doesn't really seem to care all that much about the road he took to get there. But in the final verses of our passage, even amidst all of the bloodshed and the sorrow to be had, there's still a hope that surfaces in the hope of a better king. And so this leads to our fourth and final point, fourth, the hope of a better king. So as this whole passage draws to a conclusion, Saul is now the failed and rejected king of Israel. But in the aftermath of Samuel's confrontation with Saul, remember Agag is still in the picture. And now Agag returns. Remember, again, Saul spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, rather than devoting him to destruction. But now Samuel steps up and he does what Saul did not. First, he calls for Agag, who struts out to Samuel without a worry in the world. And then Samuel hacks him to pieces. It's a vivid and gruesome description. But in doing so, again, he did what King Saul failed to do he brings destruction to the Amalekites. Samuel, unlike Saul, has looked evil in the face and he's done what he could to deal with it. But what's interesting is that in the aftermath of Agag's execution, we come to find out that the Amalekites aren't quite destroyed at this point. Because later in 1 Samuel 30, we'll get there next year maybe, in 1 Samuel 30, we read that David wars against the Amalekites himself. And by the end of this skirmish that David has with the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 30, we learn that 400 Amalekites escape his grasp. Even David can't completely bring the Amalekites to ruin. Even David can't rid the land of evil. And in fact, it's not until the book of Esther, until some resolution is brought to that narrative thread in the Bible. You see, in the book of Esther, if you're familiar with it, we meet this man whose name is Haman. And Haman is called in the book of Esther the enemy of the Jews. And he's also identified biographically as an Agagite, that is a descendant of Agag and as a Amalekite. And as the story goes, Haman develops this personal grudge against one Jew, a guy named Mordecai. And so naturally, he seeks the annihilation of every Jew across the Persian Empire. And in doing so, he nearly avenges the slaughter of his ancestor, Agag. But as the story of Esther unfolds in God's extraordinary providence, you probably know the story, the tables get turned on Haman by the end of Esther. He's unable to annihilate the people of God. And instead, he himself and his people are annihilated. It's interesting, I think, that the end of the Amalekites, assuming it comes in the book of Esther, happens when there's no king of Israel upon the throne. The context for the book of Esther is Israel in exile, and yet God is still committed to getting justice for his people and to warring against opposition for the kingdom of God, even when his kings, whether good or bad, are unable to do it on their own. And one day in the future, God, we learn in the scriptures, would step into human history himself, 
in the person and work of Jesus Christ to deliver the final blow that Saul could not against an enemy that transcends the Amalekites, namely sin, death, and the devil. Now, for one thing, thinking about Jesus, Jesus would prove to be the king who yielded in his state of a servant perfect obedience. Notably, in Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews picks up on the same theme that's quoted in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 through 23, this theme of obedience being better than sacrifices. And the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that Christ's whole life was an offering of perfect obedience to God in order to cover our blatant disobedience and sin. And then as our obedient king, Jesus waged war against sin, death, and the devil, and he won. And he promises to come back again and complete the mop-up operation when the eschaton dawns. And in doing so, Christ has dealt the final blow to the seed of the serpent, which was anticipated from all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. He's revealed to be the true king that Saul was not, and even that David was not. And so understand with that narrative thread in mind that while our passage in 1 Samuel 15 ends on a rather dreary note, Samuel and Saul separate, they're no longer on speaking terms, the throne, at least until the next chapter, is empty, and the Amalekites and the evil they represent are not yet annihilated. That doesn't mean that God was giving up on his people, nor was he giving up on his promise to provide a better king for his people. And friends, God hasn't given up on us despite our superficial obedience either. Understand that even when we find that our obedience in our pilgrimage as Christians is much like Saul, that is superficial or driven by ulterior motives, God doesn't change his disposition in the covenant, in his covenant promises towards us. In fact, he's already set his true king upon his throne. And this is a king who, unlike Saul, doesn't throw us under the bus. Rather, he's identified with us in our disobedience. Remember what Saul did? Saul said it was their fault. Well, Jesus identifies with us when it is our fault. He took upon himself our disobedience and he clothes us in his obedience. And in doing so, he brings us into the family of God. And so as we wrap up our study of 1 Samuel 15, and we're left with this sad context of failure, know, brothers and sisters, that failure is not the end of the story, and it's not the end of our story either. And so the exhortation for us is to submit to the true king by faith, to rest in the obedience of our true and better king, Jesus Christ, knowing that in Christ our disobedience has been covered by his perfect life, and by his perfect death on the cross. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for these reminders and for this great contrast that even though Saul proved to be a failed king, a king who you in your providence and wisdom rejected as being king, that you have indeed set a better king upon his throne, our Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us right now, Lord, I pray that despite this failure that we see in Saul and the failure that we see in ourselves to render perfect obedience or anything resembling that to you, that you have already covered our disobedience by Christ. And I pray that that would draw us closer to you in love and obedience and that you would be glorified in our discipleship. We ask this all in Christ's name.